This video is brought to you by Slate Black Industries. For grips and accessories, visit slateblackindustries.com. Guys, we've got an excellent episode coming up, but I wanted to tell you that we also had interviewed Rob, a U.S. Army trained sniper, someone you may recognize from some other channels, to talk to us about the M24 and its role from a sniper's perspective. So we'll see you guys at the debrief. wanted to take an M24 on this course. There are certain shortcomings, of course, but it's a system that I think a lot of us in North America are very familiar with. On top of that, there's a certain GWAT je ne sais quoi about this thing. So shall we? Let's do it. All right, I'm set. All right, target one, 100. Two shots per target here. Stand by. Okay. Impact. Yeah, got him. Okay, okay. Target two, behind it, left side. Impact. Target three. This is 300. Impact. Nice, dude. Those are stacked rounds. Very cool. Nice. Ready? Yep, I'm on at 400. Nice. Impact. Nice. Okay. Oh, you know what, Josh? I'm actually starting to see Mirage. This is a little sooner than I'm used to. Yeah, because we just took a couple warm-up shots, right? Nothing Yeah, I mean, crazy. and then we had it cool off. So this is a lot sooner than I'm used to seeing Mirage. Got it. Okay. Well, I'm on a target number five. This is 500. The okay. Know Your Limits rack next to next to the target here. Okay, I'm holding three mils over yep. with the holdover. Sounds good. Nice. Right center. Just, just right of center. Nice. I don't know if it's because it's a cold day. Oh, and I'm yeah, seeing a little bit more effect from the barrel. I don't know. I mean, you're... Your breath is pouring out. Yeah. See your breath. But maybe after two shots, I'll like kind of open the port again and let it cool. Okay. Well, we're on a target six. Impact. Left side. Yep. Nice. Target dial number up 700 seven. yep. to 650 meters. 650, and we said maybe a bit of a belly hold on this, right? Yeah. Okay. I, I am there. Impact. Actually, it's a dead hold, dude. Two. 
Yeah, that was just on the bottom left corner. Okay, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm on there at 800. Okay. I'm just seeing, like, I'm seeing a little bit of mirage right now, but I, I think I could try to push it. Okay, go for it. Impact. Good elevation. Left edge. Okay. Stand by. You ready? Yes, sir. I try to center that one. One more? Yeah, give us one more. I mean, that was definitely a miss. Uh, off the right side on those two. Okay, that one, I pushed it back center, though. Okay, stand by. Elevation was good? Yeah. It's off the left. Nothing? Uh, not positive on that one. I mean, it was definitely off. Impact. I'm not doing anything different between those shots, dude. Hmm. Well, that one was uh, on the low left corner of the target. Uh, that's where I was holding for that one. Yeah, my dials are fine. I, I am not doing anything different on my dials and what it's supposed to do. Nine, I'm gonna dial 850. Okay. Impact. That one was just a couple inches above center, up closer to his neck, okay? Okay. Ready? Yep. Yep. Is it hit? Yep. There's a at this distance, what I've seen uh, spotting these is that the 308 uh, impacts start to get very hard to see mm -hmm. um, on these targets. Like, they just don't make that huge pop of, uh, of splash on impact. But, yeah, that was a hit. But we could hear it, though. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, that was a hit. Okay. Okay, I'm on at 1,000. I believe that was a little bit off the left. Okay. I can, I, it's kind of weird because there's very, there's, the wind flag isn't really showing it, but I'm seeing Mirage moving right to left. Ah, uh, I see. I, I do not see anything on the vegetation, so I held a dead hold. Let me try to push it to the right. That was a dead, dead impact. Left side. Left side. Okay. Uh, perfect elevation. Same spot. Stack the rounds. All right. That was uh, that was an interesting run, Josh. But it. I'm wondering if there's any heat issues. Obviously, M24s are not designed to stack round after round after round to push. Uh, high volume of fire out. I mean, it's got a non-detachable magazine for crying out loud. Um, let's do this. Let's go back to 800 right now and collect two hits. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let's check it out. 800. Yeah. Let me uh, get the camera back over there. But I'm... all right. So at 800, holding 7.5 at a low hold. Okay. Ready? Yes, sir. Impact, bottom left corner. I would say, was that a dead center hole or a, a belly hold at 750, no windage correction? Yes. I would say hold right half, dead center uh, elevation. Right oh. half, impact, dead center. It was a wind shift. It was a wind shift. That's what happened at the 800. I mean, it, it weirded us out. That was we that were. was really that was really crazy. Okay, so that was that was honestly on on my call. 
Well, and mine too. I mean, I didn't see the wind. I, I could not. see it when we flexed, when we went over to the thousand. Mm -hmm. I had better visibility with how the light was hitting and what I could see through the glass. I was able to see Mirage moving right to left, which, to be honest, I've not seen anything to that effect yeah, all the it, way out. If you look at it right now, none of the wind flags are moving. So that's an interesting take on basically how you could have multiple wind channels and if you're like just not on your game and i honestly i was just looking at vegetation but, to the right but that's side. even it's even a step further than that isn't it it really gets into the value of having a spotter who's on very good class who is paying very close attention to what the mirage is doing because yeah. i was doing what you were doing i was simply observing the wind flags and the vegetation i wasn't seeing anything significant but at 800 900 1000 mm -hmm. A couple miles an hour of wind, even though it's not like, look, you can see the flag flexing out now. Okay, so, so even I'll with that you, type of even with that type of windage, you know, you holding slightly left to account for you know a tenth or two tenths of mm -hmm. a mil of what we had called it at versus how it adjusted. You know, it, that's that comes down to really not neither of us catching that the wind made a shift. Yeah, I think we, there's a lot to learn from this and. Let's talk about more at the deeper. See you guys there. Oh, well, hello there. I didn't see you. You must have stumbled upon me enjoying the sunshine of the day, says I was bird watching with my M24 sniper weapon system. Now, I hope you're enjoying the content thus far, because content like this is made possible not only by Slate Black Industries, but by the patrons of Patreon. Well, that's true. They are our main support, financially, intellectually, and most importantly, emotionally. They make content like this possible. And I'd like to invite you to come along, and become one of the patrons of Patreon. Along our journey of exploration of firearms technology and what we can do with these weapon systems. And if not, it's okay. But that's enough with this. Let's get on with the show. I mean, this has been a rifle I've wanted personally on the show for as long as, we, as, long as we've run the show. Uh, if you look at sniper weapons, uh, sniper rifles around the world, the vast majority of sniper rifles were either designed uh, based off of military rifles. That's the most, that's the majority of them. Some of them are based off of uh, original designs like the SVD, the AIs, but the U.S. decided to you to do a uniquely American thing and base the sniper rifle off of hunting rifles. So initially, the Marine Corps with the uh, Model 70s and the M24. On top of that, I would say this particular one with the uh, the colors of my era, the GWAT paint that's on there, and this is a genuine M24. This is not a clone. So, it's pretty. But how did it shoot? So we were able to match the M24 with the proper M118LR uh, cartridge. And since this is an original rifle, we were able to match it with the Leupold scope that is 10 by 42. Might I add, very similar to the 5R that we shot way earlier on in the uh, history of practical accuracy. And I think it was a very deadly accurate rifle, if I may say. Oh, I, I think you can probably say that. You, uh, you showed off a little bit there at the uh, 100 and 200 yard targets, just some straight taps into the, uh, the old head box. Well, and then at 300, you stack the rounds. Th those were like literally touching each other at 300. So clearly the rifle in and of itself is very accurate from a, a raw accuracy perspective, right? Yeah, I, I would say even out to the thousand yard target, they were almost stacked, weren't they? On the thousand, you did actually, st they were probably two to three inches apart at a thousand. So, I mean, that's... And when I shot this rifle too, on paper, it was also extremely accurate. Uh, so uh, I, I, I don't think there's any doubt whether it's an accurate rifle or not. It's a very capable rifle. Mm -hmm. But 
Partially, though, the M24 does has, have its quirks. And, and I do think it's interesting to, you know, if we were to delve into the history of it and kind of like mince through some of the small details of the M24. Um, I don't know if you know that the M24 is equipped to take iron sights. Well, I was aware. And obviously you can actually see it with the front sight on the barrel. <laughs> Yeah, that was the. Oh, that's not. A, that's a front side base. Ah, so not actually. The sights the, are detachable. Got it. Okay. Yeah, so it's kind of like the British L ninety six system. So the seven six two AI that the British use, uh, those do come with iron sights on them, and the M twenty four had detachable iron sights in the system itself. Uh, in the back, if you look closely, it actually has rear iron sight bases as well. One of the biggest quirks of the M24 is that it is, in fact, a long-action receiver that shoots a short-action cartridge, i.e. the 7.62 NATO. And so for those of you who may not be aware of what Henry's talking about, long actions are designed to shoot what are usually magnum calibers, but they're your bigger, longer cartridges. And the short actions shoot things, as Henry said, like the... 7.62 NATO or 6.5 Creed, for example, some of the other 6mm cartridges, and so on. And anything that doesn't require that extra long uh, throw on the bolt coming all the way back toward the shooter. With all this said, and especially with the conversations on sniper doctrine, uh, I know that we're going to have a SME joining us here who is a U.S. Army trained sniper and who actually... Uh, has had the opportunity to train and or use the M24 system. Isn't that right? Yes, he is actually someone that many of you out there may actually know, but never knew that he was a sniper. So I'd like to bring on Rob over from the Vintage Rifle Shooting Club or the AKOU and uh, let Rob talk about the M24 system as a U.S. Army sniper. So when M24 started trickling down to the U.S. Army, uh, we are talking about the basically mid to late 88. First orders were cut uh, in around October 1988. And of course, because of the bureaucracy and everything, uh, before <laughs> the soldiers uh, in the sniper sections actually could see the M24s. It took uh, some time. That's why in 1989, the Panama, you still had the M21 used uh, during the invasion and uh, by the snipers. Now, this was basically a break away from the trend the US Army was pushing basically since the World War II. And what I mean by this, we were walking away from semi-automatic sniper rifles because we had the M1C, M1D, which was based on the ground semi-automatics. And uh, then, of course, the M14, which was morphed into the XM21 and XM21 morphed to the M21. Uh, and that all kind of ceased and the M24 back to the bolt action pop out. And uh, rifles chambered in 7.62 by 51 uh, NATO. But from the beginning, uh, the army was talking about having a long action because they wanted to be open into the future developments uh, for the for the basically they wanted to have a wiggle room for the different cartridge on that receiver. And that's why we end up with the long action. Now, I'm not that old. And when I came into the section, to the sniper section, basically those were already packed in and they were being taken away. And we were receiving the M2010, or some remember XM2010, and those were built basically on the M24 receivers. And the M2010 is in a 300 Winchester Magnum, and that's the longer cartridge than 7.62 by uh, 51. So, of course, 
if you will follow that logic uh, of the when the M24 was created, then uh, you see why this was happening. Now, there was a program run by uh, the Remington and you could buy refurbished uh, M24s, but some of them were uh, basically only having the stock and the scope from the original M24 because a lot of M24 receivers were converted uh, to the uh, 2010 from my understanding. This is, this is the real and true M24 uh, receiver rifle and the barrel and uh, they are kind of hard to find in the true M24 form, uh, 24 form. So when I was uh, in uh, the section, these were literally packed and being shipped out. Now, Henry uh, is asking me a few, a few questions to follow. The another question is, what kind of uh, impact uh, at what distance target is expected of one of your, your soldiers with M24? So for M24, the textbook uh, assignment was, of course, up to 800 meters, which is basically 880 yards, almost 880 yards. Now, they are recorded shots or kills, which were made and uh, they were past 1,000 yards, of course, and uh, the, the rifle could deliver. But you were running into the limitations of the 7.62 by 51 cartridge. And uh, as you know, around even with M118 LR, around, uh, I would say, 900 meters, close to 1,000 yards you're running. Depends on the conditions and everything, you will start running into the uh, transonic and subsonic uh, territories and that's going to start affecting your performance. So that's the limitations and that of course now if you will take the M2010 which replaced the M24 with 300 Winchester Magnum one of the biggest selling points was we increased that range by 50 percent to basically 1200 meters. So you can understand the logic <laughs> why the 300 Winchester Magnum makes uh, more sense. But going back to the M24, 800 meters date, up to 800 meters, uh, you are qualifying at the sniper school with the 7.62 by 51 uh, cartridge. So that was the, the expected standard. Could this rifle do better? Absolutely. Uh, but it, it was taking more out of you because of the cartridge limitations and uh, how does the sniper community regard the m24 so the m24 was rather loved rifle right it, it was the first rifle uh, sniper rifle for the u.s uh, army snipers in that uh, synthetic stock so no more wood we jump out and uh, we have a synthetic stock and also it was purposely built uh, sniper rifle from the beginning. So sniper sniper weapon system SWS was the whole package delivered by uh, Remington with the 5R rifling and the R is for Russian guys. So I'm not joking. That was uh, uh, originally designed created for the AK 74s, but that's the story for another video. <laughs> but uh, the whole package was rather welcome, and the people really liked the accuracy of the M24 uh, was outstanding and uh, numerous tests were, were concluded, performed and those barrels could withstand 10,000 rounds. Uh, in some cases, the, the, there were claims that they're becoming actually more accurate after those 10,000 uh, shots fired. So there you go. Uh, there were some things which were not loved or, or liked. There were issues with the trigger and that was going back to the Remington 700 series, but the US Army Sniper School at Fort Benning, my memory serves well, they actually participated. Their data from the school was used in the lawsuit against the Remington uh, about, about the triggers and the whole, you know, hoopla and what was happening there. Uh, and that kind of took the <laughs> Remington down too, but that was their own fault uh, with the trigger design. Uh, and then of course, there was a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say controversy, but you have to be careful with uh, that long action. And uh, a lot of people get caught up. They were short stroking the bolt 
and when they were short stroking the ball, they were not pulling to the to the very end and the round stuck in magazine, you were basically sliding or gliding over the round and uh, you were not picking up the round from the magazine. And then at the test, uh, qualification test, if you do that and, and you basically did that empty click, that counted against you and that was points lost on the board. So there was a lot of pissed off people about that, but going back to that uh, long action, you really, you know, you cannot run this uh, like a freight train and there is a lot of technique involved in cycling the boat, but smooth and steady boat operation is successful to be uh, very persistent and accurate behind the rifle so you don't waste the time. Okay, you could cycle the boat really fast, but if you're going like a freight train, you're completely disrupting your position. And if you're doing it, you're, you're losing the side picture and everything. So yes, you did cycle the ball very quickly, but was it worth it? So sometimes that smooth and steady motion, but you're staying on target, you're seeing what's happening, is a much better solution. Another thing which I want to talk about it was the issue with uh, the stock and the adjustment for the length of pull that very often was becoming loose and uh, the people were bitching about that and, and rightfully so that this is not the optimal solution and you got these like two uh, lock knots and that was becoming loose and people did not like that so uh, these were you know like a uh, quirks associated with m24 but overall it was very successful uh, rifle so that's it from me going back to Henry. So I think that might provide us a decent opportunity then to switch gears just a little bit and uh, circle back to the performance of the rifle on this particular run. At the onset of this, we talked about how we actually thought that the rifle was exceptionally accurate and that the run was actually quite good. Um, obviously, when you watch the run, we had a little bit of a hiccup at the 800 yard target where I think you actually had four misses on the way out, followed up by two shots clean at nine, one miss at a thousand, and then two clean hits at a thousand, almost stacked on top of each other. Because at that point in time, we had sorted out what was going on. We came back, cleared the 800 in two shots. So what I'd like to do here is sort of talk about uh, that particular element, which is outside or beyond the M24 itself, but is an aspect and uh, a feature, if you will, of shooting at distance as part of a team. Yeah, yeah. So I think, first of all, I think we've got to... Well, I felt that the wind that day was actually deceivingly difficult. Mm -hmm. Now, on paper, it doesn't, it doesn't sound like it's anything, right? It just... It's just... It seems like a low wind day. But we were getting multiple wind channels, and we honestly didn't click. It didn't click with us. And if you're getting multiple opposing wind channels mm -hmm. at a choppy, uh, coming in very choppily, that's even worse. And part of that, I think it was a cold day. And so Mirage was actually coming off of the barrel a lot sooner than I was used to on, let's say, like when we're shooting out at 100, you know, 100 degrees Fahrenheit out there. You know, it's just, um, I was seeing a little bit more Mirage. And so when I ended up, looking at downrange at the target i was not observing the mirage downrange like at all because to me i just just thinking that's just mirage coming off the barrel and so i was looking at the vegetation i didn't see a lot of vegetation down there but i also i was not observing the close range vegetation to see how wind was doing at a closer distance so i was on a linear one track mind and looking at the distance and not observing everything that all the wind indicators that I needed to observe. So right, so as we were working our way out there, I had the same perception you did. And that's like, I wasn't really paying attention to what was happening because we had doped what, maybe two or three shots before we turned the cameras on for the run. Everything seemed normal. The wind was moving in a direction at our position, the little tiny bits we could feel that seemed normal for what we were doing. And then after your first hit at the 800, suddenly you're off the right, off the right, then off the left, and then you collect a hit. 
and it was odd to us. We didn't really know what to make of it at the moment, but as soon as I changed the angle of the spotting scope slightly to look down onto the further targets out to 900 and 1,000, I could see the Mirage moving the other direction compared to what our wind call had been. And that was obviously a very minor wind call we had made. And just that other that slight wind channel down there, whatever it was doing, was enough to throw us off. And it gets into the conversation, as you brought up, on the 308. You guys have to remember that uh, even the 118 LR, that is a cartridge or a projectile, the projectile leaving that cartridge. If you introduce something as simple as just three miles an hour worth of wind, you're looking at something like 0.7 mils or a little more than that worth of movement on where that projectile is going to impact. This is a full value, of course. At 800, it's almost 0.85 mils. At 900, you're at a full mil, and at 1,000, you'd be at about 1.15, 1.2 mils. These are enough, especially when Henry has got a wind call that's already got him holding the other direction based on what we saw on the Mirage. These are easily enough to miss the target. And it gets into, again, where is the 308 capable of impacting at these distance? Of course, absolutely. But the challenge and the technical challenge of getting the wind call very correct becomes more and more important as compared to some of the more sort of wonder cartridges or larger magnum cartridges. When we shot the 5R specifically, that those were not choppy winds that we were dealing with. That was a constant blow. And so as I pushed the 5R out, and I was watching the vegetation as I went out, mm -hmm. this time I wasn't. I wasn't even it, really looking at the mirage or anything It wouldn't like have that. even so, mattered for you. The vegetation wasn't moving. The only thing that I was able to see that clued me into it was watching the path of the mirage uh, at distance. And that was the only thing that clued, in, clued me into what was going on, which allowed us to make the fire correction at 1,000, collect the two hits, go back and get them at 800. And that goes to show you mm -hmm. the vital importance of having a spotter who is being competent and paying attention and working with the shooter. Not just, mm -hmm. you know, not just being there and observing the impacts and saying, well, this is where the impact went, but actually feedbacking effective information to the shooter. Now, Henry and I don't mm -hmm. normally work in that same relationship of spotter shooter because normally I'm more trying to assist with the filming aspects of things. But uh, it is something that I'm working on and developing a skill set to do. And it is, in my opinion, an exceptionally challenging thing to do effectively. So if you learn nothing else from the run today, learn that you have to have a teammate who's really clued in and there to support you on both sides. But as a learning moment, I think this is important. And I honestly don't think we should penalize the rifle score for what we did not do as a shooter, a shooter and, and spotter. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I mean, clearly the rifle was capable of collecting those hits. We demonstrated it was capable of collecting the hits. But more than anything, the PA series has always been about being realistic about what the rifle is capable of doing in capable and effective hands. And I think mm -hmm. when we are honest with ourselves about what we were or weren't doing effectively on that particular run, you know, we can say, put our hands up and say, as a team of spot or shooter, we didn't make the right wind call or we didn't catch specifically, we didn't catch the change in wind. And that caused us to take some extra shots that really weren't the fault of the rifle at all. So... This has been an absolute pleasure shooting this rifle, and we must thank our viewer, Sean, for sending in the rifle. Uh, Sean, I mean, this is a valuable piece of relic of the global war on terror era of the U.S. military. And we'd, I'd like to thank uh, Rob for coming on the show and, and talking a little bit about sniper operations. And I'd also like to thank Brandon from the gun room for helping us on the transfer process. But as we talk about some of the potential deficiencies of, let's say, a fixed magazine rifle shooting uh, a short action cartridge through a long action and how some of that could cause issues, what do you think it would do when we put it 
turn the pressure up a little bit and add an extra element to it. Mm. What do you think would happen, Josh? I mean, there's only one way to find out, Henry. There is indeed. We know. But the audience, you're going to find out very, very soon. So look forward to the Speedway episode of the U.S. Army's M24 Sniper Weapon System. We appreciate your time. It's been our pleasure running this rifle. We'll see you on the range. Two, one big door, two packs, Raycon one, over.